Good morning and thanks for joining us, Finland Mennonite Church on YouTube. We are jumping back in to the series called Stories That Transform. And our sermon title for this morning is Having What It Takes. We'll be taking a look at Luke 9 verses 51 to 62. And hearing the title, Having What It Takes, you may think you're about to hear a motivational speaker. Uh, you're going to give you a rah-rah speech about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps or feel like you're back in high school at the old pep rally, but that's not the case. So let's add a little context into our discussion. We've been studying parables, and not just any parables, but specifically the parables of Jesus and those recorded in the book of Luke. Before getting any further, it would be good to refresh our memories. What is a parable? A parable is a teaching tool. It's nothing more than a way of using that which is known or familiar to draw out a deeper truth that is hidden or obscure. The word parable comes from a Greek word meaning comparison, illustration, or analogy. And Jesus isn't the only teacher to employ the use of parables. In fact, almost all teaching includes comparison of the unknown with the known in some sort. I and mean, we, we all do this. Imagine you were trying a new food, say for example, alligator meat, and you were tasked with trying to describe it. You may say, well, it kind of tastes like chicken. Or imagine if you were trying to explain the sport of cricket. You may say, well, it has baseball-like elements, but not quite. Or what if you wanted to explain to someone what a kumquat was? One way you could do it would be to say, well, it's a little bit larger than a grape. It's an orange-like fruit. And this use of comparison is a key component in the art of parable telling. The Gospel of Luke not only records the most parables of any book in the Bible, it by a considerable margin also contains the most unique parables not recorded in any other Gospel. Why is this worth our time? Aren't these just cute children's stories? Parables are worth our time because parables were worth Jesus' time. We claim to follow this Jesus as Christians. Are you aware that of Jesus' recorded words in Scripture, one-third of them are used to tell a parable? By some calculations, it's as much as 35%. Suffice to say, if you have problems understanding and applying parables, you're probably going to have problems understanding and applying Jesus. What parables have we looked at so far in this series? Reach back in your uh, mind. See if you can remember. We took a look at the parable of the log and the speck, looking at what it's like to consider um, not judging someone else for a small inconsistency or error in their life when we have a large log in our own eye, so to speak. We took a look at the money lender forgiving debts, and we saw that he who has been forgiven much loves much. There's deep truths in these simple stories. You see, in the Christian context, parables are more than convenient teaching tools. Parables engage our imaginations and open us up to consider kingdom realities that require something of us personally. Before we dive into today's scripture, I do want to give you a quick heads up so you're able to watch for some unique points about today's passage. You see, the parabolic elements of our scripture this morning are not your typical long-form story in the traditional sense of what you might think when you hear the word parable. But rather, we're going to take a look at three short, concise word pictures Jesus offers in response to three different people he encounters. The strength of these parabolic statements lies in their combined witness as opposed to their individual details because there aren't really many individual details. And I'm not going to hide from you what I believe these encounters are trying to ask of us this morning. In fact, the sermon title basically gives it away anyway. Do you have what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus? Here in week three of our series on parables is the perfect place for us to stop and ask this question of ourselves. This summer has before us a buffet of Jesus' teaching, but if we have no intention of allowing these stories to transform us, then we are wasting our time. In these verses we're about to read, Jesus is going to pull no punches. 
It is absurd to call ourselves followers of Jesus if we are unwilling to go where he leads. We're only fooling ourselves. Without further ado, let's dive into the scripture and see what it has to say for, to us this morning. I think you're going to see what I mean. If you haven't turned to your Bibles already, open them up to Luke 9, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament, and we're going to be at verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him, because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Our passage this morning starts off setting the stage for the exchanges we're primarily going to focus in on this morning. Jesus has been traveling from town to town with his band of disciples, proclaiming the kingdom of God, healing, and casting out demons. Verse 51 marks a shift in the narrative of Luke as Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem. The time is coming for him to be taken up, which Luke doesn't explain any more than that, but this side of Calvary, we know, means that he's about to be received up to the higher elevation city of Jerusalem, lifted up on a cross, and ultimately received up to heaven in his glorious ascension. The journey starts now. And Luke portrays Jesus' undeterred resolve using language that echoes the prophetic words of Isaiah 50 verse 7, foretelling that the suffering servant would set his face like a flint, or stone. There is a mission in sight, and Jesus' face is steadfastly focused on fulfilling his assignment. And it's fitting because we see that the first stop on their journey is met with opposition. While there is much we could unpack from the rejection by the Samaritan villagers and the response of the disciples, I'm going to direct you to our Dig Deeper guide for this week for a more focused look there. But for now, simply know that this potential distraction could not derail the mission and instead became a mere bump in the road. A road on which they would soon meet three prospective disciples. Three encounters with three different people. As I said earlier, very few details are given about these particular people. Who they are, their background, the situation where they ran into Jesus, pretty much nothing. Two volunteer their services. One is specifically called by Jesus himself. These are simply people they met as they were going along the road. The important part must be in Jesus' response. Otherwise, Luke would have no reason to not simply relay the cold hard facts. Why did not Luke simply say, Along the road we ran into a couple people. Some followed, some did not. What does Luke, and by extension Jesus himself, want us to pick up on? I believe that these encounters teach us three principles of discipleship. Put another way, I believe that these encounters tell us three key truths we must face if we intend to accept the call to follow Jesus, to help us to see if we have what it takes. Our first encounter finds someone approaching Jesus with a declaration, I will follow you wherever you go. And that sounds like quite the statement of commitment to me. I can imagine several responses I expect Jesus to give when someone declares something like this, and most of them sound kind of like this. You will? Excellent. Welcome to Team Jesus. Let's change the world. 
Or, you can never have enough disciples. I have 12, but what's one more? Or maybe even, glad to hear it. Sign here on the dotted line to join our mailing list. And here's a t-shirt. But instead, we find Jesus saying things that involve the housing situations of various wild animals. Jesus is beginning a pattern we will see repeated where he calls those who desire to follow him to count the cost of following. And his response leads us to the first principle of discipleship for this morning. The call to follow Jesus is a call to sacrifice. For the first disciples, this meant an existence as wandering itinerant preachers, living without consistent lodging or a place to belong. We've already pointed out that Jesus' face was set to Jerusalem, and there would be no comforts of home on this death march. For as we know, Jesus had a date with the cross. And several times, Jesus will make clear that those who follow him must take up their cross as well. Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus, God in the flesh, the very one responsible for all the beauty and creation that we see all around us and all the good and lovely things we see in the world, himself lived rejected and homeless when he walked the earth among us. And he calls his disciples to follow him. To live rejected and homeless means to trust God and know that ultimately one's home is with him. Go ahead and file this bird imagery away in the back of your mind for later because we'll take an extended look at it in a few weeks when we explore Luke 12, where we'll read, Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storerooms or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable, valuable are you than birds? The call to live without goes hand in hand with the call to trust God. For each of us, this call is going to look a little different. For some of us, it may include a very real need to forsake something physical, to give it up, to sacrifice it, to let it go, to leave behind the comfort of this present world for the good of Christ's kingdom and our eternal reward. Or maybe the homelessness you'll experience is a little more figurative than literal. How so, you ask? Following Christ should sometimes make you feel like you don't fit in, like you don't belong other than. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18. In a lot of ways, Christians exist as outsiders, as an exile living in modern day Babylon, forsaking commitments to self, family, country, and all other allegiances that war for influence over our lives. For all of us, perhaps even harder than physical sacrifice, the call to follow Christ is a call to leave behind a piece of ourselves. As Pastor Jerry reminded us in his last sermon before his sabbatical, there are things in each of our lives that do not need to be indulged, but need to die. They must be laid down at the cross so that Christ's love and light can shine through us. What might those things be in your life today. We will remain Christian in title only until we submit to the call to sacrifice. Our next encounter begins slightly differently, but the discussion follows a similar track. This second man finds himself called by Jesus directly and responds that he will follow but first needs to bury his father. Now, this is possibly the best available Jewish excuse to delay following that you could ever come up with. Because in Jewish culture, there was no greater ritual requirement than burying one's father. This is a Jewish, and by extension, biblical ethical priority. Biblical scholars disagree here on where we find ourselves on the timeline of the man's father's death and burial rites. Some believe that perhaps he is being called by Jesus right in the middle of his father's burial procession. Others conjecture the exchange is most likely taking place between the first and second burial. It will be the responsibility of the son to gather the bones after the flesh is uh, decomposed 
and move them to their file, final burial resting place. A third theory is that this is just a stalling tactic, and the man's father hasn't even passed away yet, meaning this response is an intention to delay discipleship for an unknown and indefinite time. Likewise, scholarly debate exists over Jesus' response. When Jesus commands to let the dead bury their own dead, it's obviously impossible for the dead to bury anything or anyone. Is this parabolic statement being extreme to point out how little Jesus cares for his excuse in light of the call for immediate discipleship? Or is it part of an elaborate pun attempting to point out that it will be the spiritually dead who bury his father when he decides to follow the immediate call to follow? Ultimately, scripture is silent on both issues, but regardless of the nuances of the situation, the fact remains that we've stumbled upon our second principle of discipleship. The call to follow Jesus is a call to rearrange our priorities. It is clear from this passage that nothing is to block the pursuit of discipleship and nothing is to postpone its start. Is it a good thing to fulfill a commitment to bury your father? Yes. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom. Is it a good thing to take care of yourself? Is it a good thing to be a committed employee? Is it a good thing to be dedicated to one's family? Is it a good thing to be a model citizen seeking the good of your town, city, and country? Yes. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom where do our priorities lie? Which perfectly segues to our third encounter along the road. Our third encounter provides the most difficult parallel of the three, perhaps for us to understand in our current modern day context. I'm afraid the analogy is probably practically lost on us because I don't think many of us are farmers. Nowadays, it's not unheard of to see autonomous GPS guided precision farming but in ancient agriculture, the person plowing the field would have to pick a spot on the horizon, maybe a tree or a bush, and focus on it to make sure their rows remained straight. The experiential activity on this week's Dig Deeper Guide will guide you or your family or group in uh, a, a chance to get to maybe test this out and see what it might be like. But as I tried to think of a modern day example, all I could think of is one that makes me feel a little silly, and that's anyone who's ever got the chance to ride a bicycle near me. When I ride a bicycle, if you would look at my trail, it would look something like this. I have a tendency to be looking off to the side, at the scenery, um, you know, staring in at the houses I'm driving by to see if I like their, uh, their <laughs> the way they're doing the yard, whatever the case may be, and I always have to look behind me to the other riders even when we're riding down the ridge road, which is kind of like a highway and has gotten a little dicey at times. One time where this really got bad for me is when I borrowed my dad's bike and was trying that out because he has those foot clips that like clip your foot to the pedal. And I wanted to try them out and see if I liked them. So we were riding on the Perkyoman Trail and I glanced behind me to look where Jackie, my wife, was, and I didn't see her anywhere. So I thought maybe she was just, you know, behind the bend or falling behind a little bit. So I rode a little bit more and looked back, and I didn't see her. So I keep looking back and back and back, and all of a sudden, I hit something and go up over the handlebars. Only problem is, I'm latched into the bike. So collarbone and head directly to the ground, bike on top of me, is where my wife found me. And ultimately, she was just had pulled over to be looking into the woods at a flower or a deer or something like that. I can't remember, understandably, because I whacked my head. But the problem is, my focus wasn't in the right place. And the call to follow Jesus is a call to undeterred focus. Looking back will surely f throw us off course. Jesus is telling the prospective disciple, and us as well, that God must be the compass of one's life. Scripture has several uh, examples of people who look back having uh, ill effects. 
We know of Lot's wife, who looked back when they were told to leave the city, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. The um, Israelites looked back after they left Exodus, after they left Egypt in the Exodus. And likewise, we're going to be tempted to look back on our old lives, old ways, and desires of the flesh. When times of testing inevitably come, where will your focus lie? Three meetings with three different people. Three parabolic answers. Three principles of discipleship. The open-ended nature of these encounters leaves us hungering to know how those Jesus engaged responded. But we just don't know. Did they risk it all and become followers of Jesus? Did they hear the call, feel the fire light deep within their hearts, count the cost and step forward in faith? Or was the cost too great? Did they walk away angry, defeated, frustrated, indifferent, or confused? The answer to these questions are answers that, quite frankly, we're not going to know this side of heaven. Scripture simply doesn't tell us. But the power of, power of parable is that our interest has been piqued, our minds engaged, and we find ourselves immersed in the story, knowing that these questions are questions not only asked of them thousands of years ago, but questions that you and I and every human who ever walks of the face of the earth all must answer. When we picture in our minds the baby birds nestled under their mother's wing in the nest, or a fox burrowing deep in its den, by contrast, we feel the ache of homelessness, of being without. We begin to feel the pain of the surrendering of comforts, luxuries, or even our most basic necessities. And we know deep within our souls that the call to count the cost is not simply for them, but for us as well today. And maybe, just maybe tonight as I settle down into my comfy bed, after driving home in my slightly above average car to my dry and secure home in our upper middle class neighborhood, maybe I should consider what I might be called to go without. And who could forget that absurd mental picture of a mummy-like person burying another character wrapped in grave clothes? The humor of that image lasts only long enough for me to realize that if I don't accept the call to discipleship, that dead man is me. And the last of Jesus' three encounters from our passage might just pack the biggest gut punch of all of them. Because I don't know about you, but when I look back on the field of my life, I see a whole lot of crooked rows. I see places in that field where you might think a drunk man was steering the plow rows that were missed, and whole sections of ground I failed to plow because the sun was too hot, the ground was too rocky, or I had taken my eyes off the prize. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And friends, I'm not going to attempt to pull a speck out of your eye while housing a log in my own. And I don't know if you think you're a $5 sinner or a $500,000 sinner, but I know which one I am. And if no one who puts their hand to the plow is fit, church, I'm in some serious trouble. And truthfully, so are you. Who among us models perfect surrender? Which of us this morning is willing to raise our hand and declare, I can live without I hold nothing back. I have given 100% of myself to follow our rabbi. Who can faithfully say that in all things, kingdom priorities are their priorities? Who of us gathered here with straight face and clear conscience is willing to claim that no distractions have knocked their focus off Jesus and his kingdom in the last year, month, week, day, or even five minutes? At this point, I'm sure I don't even need to ask the question that our sermon title for this morning begs. Do we have what it takes? No. But praise be to God that there is someone who does. And that someone more than shows us the way, 
but provided a way for his righteousness to be imparted to us. Someone who embodies the very essence of sacrifice. Someone who set aside their privileges and glory, emptied themselves, ultimately sacrificed life and limb. Someone whose priorities are always heaven's priorities. And someone with an undeterred focus, face set like flint, faithful to put his hand to the plow and not look back. Two questions for us to consider this morning. The first, are you relying on the hope that you have what it takes or falling on the mercy of the one who does? It makes little sense to consider thinking all summer as we look at these parables about thinking about you know how well we're following Jesus if we've never really even made the commitment to do so. Jesus died on the cross some 2,000 years ago to offer those of us who don't have what it takes a way to be redeemed. But Jesus won't force himself on you, and no one becomes an accidental Christian. The scary thing about all this is that it seems Jesus has no qualms with allowing you to walk away today. That's your choice. It's really the only loving thing to do, and scripture is clear that God is love. But he desires none to perish, and he's calling you now, whether you choose to acknowledge it or not. So friend, what'll it be? Second question. If we have decided that we've put our hope in Jesus, what if Jesus was serious? The story is told of a pastor who started a multi-week Sunday school class on the Sermon on the Mount. And after their first read-through as a group, seeing some of the intense uh, requirements and calls of Jesus, the pastor asked the group this question. How many of you think Jesus was serious? And not a single hand went up. What if the call to follow Jesus is a call to sacrifice? What if the call to follow Jesus is a call to rearrange our priorities? And what if the call to follow Jesus is a call to undeterred focus? What if Jesus was serious? Because I believe he was. So how will you respond? How is God calling you through these stories to be transformed? If you're daring enough to take an honest look at these questions this week with scripture in hand, I believe it will be revealed to you. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you uh, this morning once again for Jesus. That you were willing to come to earth, to set aside everything, um, to sacrifice for us. Uh, we thank you that you knew that we would never be able to, to bridge this gap on our own, but you were willing to do what it took. We ask for your help in establishing clear focus on your kingdom. We know that we're going to fail at rearranging our priorities, and, and we ask that by your Spirit's help, you would guide us into the way that you would want us to engage the world for you. Be with us as we move through this series. Help our eyes to be opened to all the ways that you want to transform us for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us. We'll be back again next week with another parable. I hope you have a great week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. Go in peace.